Well, I'm very happy to see you today as we come back to do the purpose and work of the Holy Spirit. Um, God really did a miracle for me this morning because my laptop that where I can see all of your faces and at least it inspires me that I'm not just talking to nobody. <laughs> Something went wrong and it got hung up and well, anyways, it looked like I wasn't going to be able to have, I was just going to have to look at myself and pray that I would get inspired. <laughs> but then I sat here and I bowed my head and I really cried out. I said, oh, God, please help me. I, I don't I just I don't know that much about all this technical stuff. And you just need to help me. So I turned the machine back on again. And instead of it being in that hung up state, it it went back to the first thing that it had done before where I had to make a choice. So I made the opposite choice where I would said, no, I don't want to install this. I said, yes, I want to install. I thought I can't get any worse than what I was. And I, don't ask me what I did. I just did as I felt led and there you all are. So I just said, God, you're so good. Um, yeah, if, if, you know, if I had taken lessons to be IT tech, but I haven't. And I just thank the Lord that I can see you all because you inspire me. Some of your faces just really <clears throat> help me to keep going. So thank you, Jesus. Anyways, we are talking about the three aspects of the Spirit's work in our lives. And the first one was revealing and enlightening. In other words, giving us revelation, knowledge opening the, our spiritual eyes, which this helps us to be able to function as Jesus would function as a prophet by being his mouthpiece. He can show us uh, new things and he can show us what to say, what not to say, when to say. And the second aspect is sanctifying, setting us apart uh, from sin, setting us apart to the Lord, so that we can be a priest unto the Lord and minister to the Lord and take the things of God and minister them to other people. And now um, the third part, which we've already done point one, of course, is strengthening for service. This is a very important part, strengthening for service, because in ourselves, we just cannot do it. In ourselves, when we witness and try to show people things, it just doesn't have any impact at all. But this is why uh, he gave his precious Holy Spirit. And this is why he wants us to pray. Uh, he says, pray until you are endued or clothed upon with power from on high, not your own strength, not your own power, but the power, the dunamis power, which is miracle working power of the Holy Spirit. And this strengthening for service is to help us to be a king in this life, not as kings, you know, we have big cars, we have big houses, we have riches, we have wealth, that's natural. We're talking about in the realm of the spirit, all right, to be a king whereby we rule and reign in this life and we rule over the powers of darkness and we are on the victory side. So praise the Lord. And our first point, which we already finished last week, is how do we reign? We reign in righteousness by letting Jesus be the king of our life, obeying him, letting him sit on the throne of our life. And then we will rule as we learn to judge sin in our life. Um, I want to say again, I don't mean that we go on a witch hunt in our own lives, but whenever the Lord stirs within us and 
uh, gives us that realization, something is amiss, we need to deal with something. When he leads and guides us and we listen to him, all right, we rule, as it says, as we judge sin, the self-life, all right, the world, the world system, and give no place to Satan's kingdom at all. All right, so now we're going to start today. <clears throat> we're going to start today with number two under Roman numeral four uh, C, and this is page 11. Number two, strengthening of the inner man. And I'm going to ask Toyin to read for us Ephesians 3, 16, and then go down and read verse 20. Ephesians 3, verse 16. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Verse 20, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Yeah. Uh, all right, so let's look at that verse 16. It says to be strengthened with might, all right, by his spirit in the inner man. So, you, you know, we have two sides to us. We have the outer, the natural, and then, of course, that flesh life that we're supposed to reckon it to be dead. But because God judged it when Jesus died on the cross, he bore that flesh life, the sin, the old nature, the old man that is ruled by the devil. All right. On the cross, he gave us a brand new spirit when he put us into Christ. He gave us this brand new spirit. All right. That's called the inner man. When we start walking by the spirit, walking by in the realm of the spirit. All right. And he says here that you might be strengthened with might. All right. With this miracle working power that um, the Holy Spirit is able to give us in the inner man. Now, you you have to look to him, believe in him. You can't just say it, it's there. And, and so that's all I have to worry about. No, in verse 20, it said, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to that power, that miracle working power that worketh in us. All right. So my testimony this morning is a testimony to that. It had nothing to do with me. I couldn't do it at all. But when I cried out to the Lord through the power of his Holy Spirit, he led me, even though I didn't know what I was doing, and he brought it about and worked a miracle that I never could have done. And normally I have, you know, way in the beginning, I used to have my daughter-in-law come every day. And she would have been here and she knows how to do all that. But I don't know. And yet when I cried out to him, according to the power that worketh in us, all right, it says he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask for things. So it doesn't matter what realm. Remember, God is not only omnipotent. That means all powerful. He is omniscient. That means he knows everything. He knows all about everything. So when we don't know what to do, how to do, when to do, why to do, we can cry out to him. Friends, he's not in there just to be a passive uh, ruler, a passive part of God just laid back inside of us. No, he's there to take charge of our life but he's not going to do it just on his own. We've got to cry out to him in our time of need, in our time when we realize we can't do it, then we need to cry out to him and he will bring strength 
to that inner man. Notice I put their strengthening. This is a continuous present going on. All right. Let, let's go to 2 Corinthians 4, 16. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but through our outward man perish. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. All right, that, this is the difference between that outward man, which is your natural man, your body, all right? Um, it says your outward man is perishing. Oh, all I have to do is <clears throat> look in the mirror every day and then go back and look at some of my pictures when I was young. Definitely the outward man is perishing. And even the mind is, you know, not, not what it was at one time. And for me, I've, I've had an infarcture, all right, which is uh, something happened, you know, and right over here in this, right, right at that point, uh, some of my brain was sucked out, all right, when I had a stroke. And so that part is not there anymore, all right? So though the outward man perished, yet the inward man, this new man, this spirit man of ours is renewed, made new every day, day by day, as we seek him, as we worship him, as we spend time in his presence, as we spend time in his word and get filled where faith is there, the inner man, though the outer man is perishing, the hair is turned white, the wrinkles are all coming on the face and it doesn't matter what you do to it, it one day we're all gonna take our rest and this old man is gonna say finished, all right? The outward man is gonna go off, but that inner man stays alive and it can be renewed. That means, you know, get like being new all over again, refresh, oh, uh, it, it gets better and better. I tell you, I have better times with the Lord than I used to. I can understand more of the word than I used to. So the inner man is becoming more and more like him. All right. Let's try it. You write this after day by day. Uh, a was number one. B is number two. Write a number three there. Psalms 92. 12 to 14, sister, would you read it? Psalms 92, verses 12 to 14. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. All right. So you see the righteous have this second nature. Amen. This inner man, this new man, the, the people of the world, they don't have that. Their spirits are dead in trespasses and sins. And so they only have that outward man. But when we're righteous, we flourish. That means we blossom, we bud, we grow. We, you know, flourish means to really glow, grow. Not, it says like a palm tree. Now, you know, a palm tree, this is talking about the desert palm. There's no water, there's nothing. Uh, it's dry all around it, but its roots go down till it finds the water. And it gets water not from its surrounding area. It managed to get water that's deep down there. All right. And it goes on growing this way, but flourishing. It means to in every part to, to benefit. And then it says he shall grow like a cedar. That's excellent. That's strong roots and, and firm. And, and like this in Lebanon, Lebanon is a mountainous area. 
So the one is whether it's desert area, whether it's a mountainous area, oh, when we're in the Lord, we just begin to grow and flourish. And it says, those that be planted, you don't plant yourself in the house of the Lord. God plants you there. When you cry out to Jesus and when you say, I need you, Jesus, he plants us in the house of the Lord. And then it tells us if you have been planted in the family of God, planted in the house of the Lord, how do you flourish? You flourish in the courts. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So as you learn to praise him, as you learn to worship him, as you learn to just lift him up and glorify him, it has a profound effect upon your spirit man. You begin to flourish, all right? And it says you will still bring forth fruit. Uh, you don't stop. As you get older, the older you get in the Lord, the more fruit you start bearing, all right? And they shall be fat and flourishing. Now, in the Nashville, we're all so afraid of getting fat, all right? But in the spiritual realm, it is good. It is good to be fat and flourishing. Uh, it's not something to go on. A, you don't want to go on spiritual diets. You want to just continue to praise and be thankful and, and obey him. And you will find that the fruit of the spirit will be there. It's a strengthening to praise, to worship, to glorify the Lord. All right. Number C, put a small four there. All right. Second Corinthians four, seven. Would you read that? Second Corinthians four, verse seven. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Yes. What is this treasure? This treasure is the life of Jesus Christ. All right. This is God's life, Jesus' life. When we cried out to Jesus, he took us and put us into Christ and put Christ into us. But this, he's a treasure. He, no amount of money can buy him. Everything we have need of is found in him. It's really marvelous, all right? But it tells us he's inside an earthen vessel. That's our outer man, all right? We're, we're nothing but a pot of clay. I don't care how God uses us without him, we're nothing but a clay pot, dead, worthless, useless. And if you are thrown down, you'll smash into pieces, all right? It says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? In order that the excellency of the power all right, that you won't look to self. You need to know you have nothing in yourself. You're nothing but a dead clay pot. No life even, all right? But it's that treasure in you. And when he came in, and then after he came in, if you cried for the Holy Spirit, which he prepared for you, which he wants, he died in order that you and I would not only get saved, but that we would be baptized in his Holy Spirit. That's part of the reason he died, all right? That's very clear over in Galatians 3, um, 13 and 14. I'm not going to go over it now. You go read it on your own. That the power, this dunamis power, this miracle working power may be of God. Know it. Recognize. Don't take the glory to yourself. If God uses you in a mighty way, uh, you pray for somebody and they get healed, don't start getting puffed up about it. it. wasn't you. It's that treasure in you. It's that power that's in you that worked through you as you cried out and depended upon him. All right. Now, uh, let's put a number five after that. Colossians 2, 2 and 3. 
Colossians 2, verses 2 and 3, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Yes, so the... the I, I use verse two, so we would understand in verse three, who in whom are hid. It's Christ, all right? In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom is to know how to do things the best way and the right way, especially to give glory to God, all right? And knowledge, of course, is just to know something that you couldn't know any other way, all right? And all of that is hid in Christ, all right? He's part of the Trinity, God and the Father, um, of course, and the Spirit. And Christ, when he goes up, he says, I have to go away. When I go away, then I'll send the Spirit down. They're all one, all right? Now, let's look at another verse with this number five. Colossians 2, um, just a minute, verse eight to 10. It's that same chapter you're in. Yes. Beware lest any man spoil, spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of Godhead bodily. Yes. So it's warning us here. Don't be sidetracked by philosophy and empty deceit all right uh, to believe what people tell you you have to do this you have to do that uh, go do this go there go there no said so don't listen to any of that all right because all we need is christ in him dwelleth all the fullness of the godhead bodily that means in him he's the only one of the godhead that took on himself a body all right and in jesus all right bodily that means however he because you can't see a spirit we can feel a spirit moving but you can't see it but in a body it can be seen it can be heard it can be felt all right and in jesus himself the fullness of the Godhead, no matter what God the Father can do, no matter what uh, God the Holy Spirit can do, all right, it can be seen in and through Jesus, all right? It's all there. So when you study the four, um, oh my, <laughs> when you study those four first books, of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they will show you Jesus in his bodily form, the way he behaved, what he did. And he tells us, you will be able to do what I've done and more. And then there's even more that I couldn't tell you that only when I send the Holy Spirit to you, you can't bear it till you're baptized in the spirit, then he can reveal it to you and you can do above and beyond what I have done. But it's only as God the Father speaks and you hear it or you see it. In other words, you're led by the spirit. You don't just jump out. Well, Jesus did it, so I'm going to do it. No, you'll find that you won't be able to. But if the Lord tells you to, yeah, it will work when you obey him, whatever it is. It might even seem silly. It might seem ridiculous. I've told you this story many times, but I'm going to tell it again. When we were pastoring Elam Church, which is many years ago now, and this is one of the last church camps that we had while we were the pastors there. And I remember we had invited uh, a man from um, 
Australia. I think he was a Bible school teacher or principal from Australia. Anyways, his messages were very good, very good. But you know, when you go to church camp, you, you want the Lord to move amongst the people. And we just didn't have that breakthrough. And we got to the last uh, sermon. In fact, our bags were packed and many of it, the smaller bags were near people because after this last sermon, uh, we were gonna go out and get on the buses and break camp. And we hadn't seen a breakthrough yet. We'd been praying and praying, didn't know what in the world. And in that last meeting, while he was preaching, uh, the assistant pastor, who is now the pastor of, um, and has been for many years in Elam, uh, God spoke to him and told him, I want you to do this. And um, he said, I want you to get up there on the platform and showed him how to put one hand like this and one hand like that and how he was to praise God and run across the platform back and forth. And he said, I will look foolish if I do that. I will really look foolish. And the Lord said, I could ask you to do what I asked my prophet Isaiah do, go naked with just a loincloth and no shoes on his feet. Oh, no, 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 he said, I I'll do it. But then he said, the Lord, Lord, I, I don't have the mic. I mean, he's preaching. I can't just go up and take the mic away from him. Um, but I'm willing, I'm willing to do it. So that was left at that. When the preacher finished preaching, he suddenly said, I just feel led to ask Pastor Glenn to come up and give the closing prayer. Well, you know, when he got up on the platform, the mic was handed to him. So his excuses for not doing what God wanted him to do had kind of been stripped away. And so he obeyed the Lord, even though in the natural, he felt foolish. He felt silly doing. And, you know, he rectified it in the beginning. He said, just to let you know, God told me to do this. And then he did exactly what God asked him to do. But you know what? The moment he started running on that platform with his hands and his body in the position God had told him and shouting out whatever it was. I don't remember if it's hallelujah, praise the Lord, something. The power of God moved in that place. People fell out of their chairs. They fell all over the floor under the power of God. And we had the greatest breakthrough that I think we've ever seen in a camp before. It was marvelous, all because somebody obeyed the leading and the guiding of the Lord, even though it sounded foolish. You, you know, had he just done that on his own, nothing would have happened. We would have probably said, what has happened to him? But the, the moment the spirit broke loose and started falling in its power all over, nobody questioned what he had done. It, it was just like, wow, this is marvelous how God has come in. So it was being led of the spirit. Amen. Um, let's go now over to the other side of five and put a six, will you? Um, six is second Corinthians chapter one, verse eight to 10. Second Corinthians chapter one, verses eight to 10. For we would not brethren have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired even of life but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. 
All right. The, the reason I chose this, all right, uh, it goes along with that verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, that the power may be of God. Here, he said he went through such terrible problems and troubles and persecution. It says above what they were able to put up with. It almost looked like they were going to have to die. But it says in verse nine, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. In other words, don't look to self. Don't try to figure it out by yourself. Don't do anything. You are, you know, what can a dead man do? What can a dead man do? And if you really understand that, that we are dead in ourselves, there is no power. There is no strength then all right it says so we should not trust in ourselves but we will trust in God he can raise the dead he can show us what to do and then he can do a miracle even through us by telling us what to do but we're depending on God we're not depending upon ourselves now go to d all right and put number seven Ephesians 1 17 to 21. Ephesians 1 verses 17 to 21. That God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. According to the working of his mighty power. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Yeah, so this strengthening of the inner man is how the hope done also by the Holy Spirit, all right? It says that you might know the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe, all right? It's not every Christian has that. No, God can show you something, but if you don't, you don't lay hold of the faith of God to believe it, I tell you, the faith that God puts into us, faith releases his spiritual power into our lives and into our situations as the Holy Spirit begins to reveal, it says, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Uh, that takes us kind of back to that first aspect, all right? It, uh, it doesn't work in three different, it's working all simultaneously at the same time. We just took it point by point, all right? This is how we know it's the work of the spirit. When he reveals Christ to us, all right? Uh, faith is born in our hearts to believe in him, for whatever the Lord shows us. And it says that you might know the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe. Um, there is nothing impossible if only we can accept and believe what God is showing us, all right? But if we, you know, if we never spend time with the Lord, if we never read his word, if we never build up that inner man, don't expect in these big events in your life when you need him. No, it, it just doesn't work. You know, every day we need to be building up the inner man. Then when you come to some big, huge thing that is like an impossibility uh, as you cry out, 
the Lord will show you, he will guide you, he will lead you, all right, uh, and show you what to do in that given case, all right. Uh, he will release that power into our lives and into our situations. Uh, I, again, this, this is the story that's coming to me. Um, I had a dream. Of course, I realized afterwards what the dream was all about. But in this dream, I had was driving a car and I suddenly came to the edge of like a precipice, all right, a huge drop. And it was kind of like the shape of the ground was like a peninsula, like that. So I came up there and in the dream, the Lord stopped me just in time. And, and when I realized that I almost went over that edge, in my dream, I cried out to God. Because I'm very afraid of heights, all right? And um, in the dream, that fear gripped me. And I knew even if I tried to like back the car, uh, you know, uh, whatever. No, no, no. I, I was just almost frozen with fear there. It, it was like there wasn't enough room to do anything. And so, as I said, in my dream, I cried out to God, God, you have to help me. Please help me. And God spoke to me. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. This is what I heard him say. He said, get out of the car and pick the car up and turn it around and then get back in and drive out. And, and in the dream, I thought, this, this is cuckoo. This is nutty. How in the world can I pick up a car? But, you know, when I obeyed, this is a dream, all right? When I obeyed the Lord, I got out of the car. Suddenly, that car, instead of it being a full-size car, that there was no way I could pick it up, all right? It suddenly went, and it became like a toy. And of course I could pick that up. I picked it up. I turned it around in my dream and it came back out the, to a full size car. I got into it and I drove away. But when I woke up, I realized what the Lord was saying to me. He was saying, get out of your situation. When you're in the middle of that situation, all you can see is the impossibilities. You don't see what I can do. You get yourself out of it. When you cry out to me, just listen to me. Do whatever I tell you to do, even if your head says it can't be done. I can do what you cannot do. Get yourself out of it and look on it like a spectator and let me tell you what to do. And you know what? That works. It just works. As long as you keep looking at it and what am I going to do and how can I do, you'll never get anything done because you don't know how. But when you cry out to the Lord, do exactly. Uh, again, I'm thinking of another story, and I'm going to tell you that story uh, of the time that, you know, I was in the house. This was in Penang. And I heard a woman screaming and I ran out of the house and I was uh, my house was next to a big like a highway quite a big road and on the other side now mine is uh if I use Chinese all right it, it would be called a yang lo all right so it was either a two or three story house and a very nice house but on the other side there was an atap house all right, quite, quite a difference. And, and the screaming was coming from that at half house. So I ran and I was going to run across uh, to see what was wrong, what happened. And the Holy Spirit told me not to go. He quoted this verse. He, he gave me this verse that says, he that meddleth in another man's affairs is like a person that takes a dog by the ears. You know what would happen when you grab a dog by the ears? They're going to bite you. So he was telling me, 
mind your own business. Don't go. That's what that verse meant. And I understood it. But, you know, I, I brushed it aside and I said, oh, no, no, no. I hear her screaming. I've got how to help her, you know, and instead of listening to what God told me, I went ahead anyways. And by the time I got across the street, I could see into that Atap house and I saw a man on top of a woman and he was just really pounding her. And I screamed, I yelled. I said, if you don't stop, I'm going to call the police on you which is threatening, and we're told not to threaten. But you know what? I didn't even have a telephone in my house. I could no more have called the police than the man on the moon, you know. So it was all just ridiculous. But of course, my sudden screaming voice, which can be very loud, uh, it scared this man, and he he stopped, and, and the lady was able to get away from him and, and run away from him. But the thing was, his anger turned on me from being angry. And he, he yelled at me and he said, what right have you to come here? This is my house. It's my wife. And, you know, but then the anger toward his own wife now is on me. And of course, I turned and I started to run. Well, he started to chase me. See, God knew all that. That's why he warned me, don't get involved. Well, when you obey the Lord, you, you're just saved a lot of problem. But too often we want to depend on how, what we see, how we feel, what we think is the right thing to do. I'm telling you, God always knows what is the right thing to do. So I started running and he was chasing. But because I had a head start on him, and I'm sure it was the Lord, I got to my house and I got in and I got the door shut and locked. And I remember I went over and I peeked out the curtains just enough. I didn't want him to see me peeking out, but I saw him in front of my house just going up and down on the five footway. And his face was angry. He was angry. I was frightened. I was frightened even though I was in my house and I cried out to the Lord and I said, Lord, what am I going to do now? Uh, you know, doesn't, if I don't go out now, the next time I go out, he might see me sometime. I be, might be out and he doesn't know you. He might take vengeance on me. Who knows? What am I to do? And the Lord spoke to me. He said, the first thing you're going to do is go downstairs and apologize to him. Are you, God, do you know what you're asking me to do? He is so angry. I'm telling you, when God tells us to do something, and I thought, well, I didn't listen the first time, so I better listen this time. So I went down, and when I went out the door, he was kind of way up there a ways. He still had to turn around to come back again. and. Um, I put my hand out like that and I said, I'm sorry, you know, by the time he got up to me, do you know what? It was a miracle. He was smiling. He, the anger was gone. He put his hand out, took my hand. We shook hands and he said, we just forget about it. And he walked off. I mean, that you don't turn an angry person like that. That had to be God. When I obeyed, God took care of the situation. And I'm sure if I would have obeyed the first time, God could have taken care of that lady. I felt I had to be the savior. No, we have to be obedient children and let God tell us what to do. So this strengthening in the inner man, all right, um, is letting us know the spirit will let us know what God wants. Let us know the great power that's released when we believe what he tells us. Um, this E will be number eight. All right. Um, Colossians 1, 11. Colossians 1, verse 11. Strengthened with all might 
according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. There it is. Wow. And the Holy Spirit not only strengthens us with all might, all uh, according to his glorious power, his ability, all right, to help us to come to a place of endurance, patience, to endure and to suffer long. That's what long suffering is, to be able to suffer a long time. But some people, you have to suffer a long time, but only God can give you the ability to suffer a long time with joyfulness, not with complaining, not with murmuring, not with backbiting, not with anger, all right, but to suffer a long time, to keep on suffering and suffering, and yet be a joyful person. This is the work that, talking about strengthening of the inner man, all right, whoa, uh, after long suffering, just put their equals to suffer long, but with joyfulness, that's the miracle of it. All right, it's the ability of God alone. All right, so number three, um, yeah, number three, enabling strength, all right, by dependence on the Lord, all right, by crying out to the Lord. Let's look at Romans 8, 15, and 16 right there, all right, at Romans 8, verse 15 and 16. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Yeah. So, um, when we were in sin, we were under a spirit of bondage. We have been called to liberty when we accept Christ. And especially when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, he gives us that ability because that spirit of bondage causes us to fear. As I've told you before, fear and faith are opposites. When you start being afraid, there, it's hard to have faith. And, and that's when I found when fear starts to grip me, that's the time to pray. Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, I don't know what to do. I need you, God. All right. Because once the Holy Spirit, we cry out to him and he begins to move and work within us, that fear will be gone because he causes us to have faith. Um, instead of a spirit of bondage, when we've accepted Christ, all right, it, the Holy Spirit is like the spirit of adoption. This adoption doesn't mean just adopting a child. It, it means the adoption that comes uh, in the old days when people became a mature son, all right, grown up they went through legal adoption to say that they, they were able to inherit and take on all the responsibilities of a grown person, all right? But this spirit of adoption is access to God. It turns us to God, to look to him, to cry out to him, to say, oh God, I need you help me. I can't do it myself. And God gives his enabling strength because we are dead and have no strength at all. Now, a number two um, is Psalms 27 verse one. And th this is um, David, King David. Hello? Sorry, Psalm 27, verse 1. Yeah. 
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Yeah, th this was David speaking, and this is the way we have to see it. Every one of us have been brought into the family of God. We're not under that spirit of bondage again. So when fear tries to attack us, no matter what the situation, be like David and recognize, hey, I don't have any light. I don't have any strength, but the Lord is my light. I don't need to be afraid, all right? The Lord is the strength of my life. He's not only given me light, he's given me strength. I don't need to be afraid of anyone. He's backing me up. I'm in him. I'm depending on him. I'm surrounded by him. I can cry out to him and he will undertake for me. Let's do this B. That's our number three. All right. Psalms eight, verse two. Psalms eight, verse two. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou might the enemy and the avenger. All right. Notice that babies, I, and what I'm talking about, I, I'm not just talking about, oh, two-year-old, a three-year-old. I'm talking about real babies, all right? They don't have strength, all right? Um, you, you carry them like this. You're always told, make sure you use two arms to carry them. One, you know, to give where their necks uh, can lay there and have support. But if you even drop one hand to go to open a door, they know it one of their hands comes up and will grab you like, hey, I don't have the strength to walk. I don't have the strength, that, but they have good lungs. They have good lungs. Babies know how to cry. They let you know what they need, what they want by crying and really. So it says here out of the mouth, not out of their arms, out of their legs, out of their, you know, head, no, out of their mouth, you have ordained strength because of your enemies, all right? As we cry to the Lord, as we praise the Lord, as we shout to the Lord, uh, the enemy's power over us is broken, all right? That's what this, um, actually, there, I should have given us that. Um, Jesus says that when he quotes this, I don't have it written here. If you find it, you can um, put it on your paper. Jesus quoted this verse. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings? Hast thou ordained praise? All right. So it tells us what that strength is as, you know, and in our relationship to the Lord, we're always babes. We're always babes. Uh, don't ever think you're full grown and I can think for myself and I don't need to ask you anything. No, no, no. See yourself as a baby, totally dependent on him. I can't do anything unless you tell me, show me, walk with me. So. Toward God, we always see ourselves as babes, but toward the enemy, all right, we see ourselves as full-grown warriors walking in the strength of the Lord. And as we do what God tells us to do and say what God tells us to say, we will see that the enemy is defeated. All right, let's look at C. Psalms 48, verse 3. Psalms 48, verse 3. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. Now tell me who lives in a palace. A king, right. And that's what we're talking about here. The work of the Holy Spirit is to help us be like kings in the realm of the spirit and to reign in this life, this life, the natural life, to go through it, not just talking about it, but when literal circumstances come, experiences come our way, 
we have that strength and power to abide in the spirit, to behave like God wants us to behave and to come forth victorious, all right? So this says God is known in her palaces for what? For a refuge. So even though we are kings in the eyes of the Lord, all right? We need a refuge. And we know God is our refuge. We know to run to him. We never think, I know that. Uh, uh, let me get the Now, what was it that God told me the last time to do? No, in each new situation, run to God as a refuge. Cry out to God and hear him tell you, all right? Being a king doesn't mean we are now independent of God. No, we seek for him for refuge. Hallelujah. The last there, D, uh, in fact, I think we will do uh, to the end of the page. And when we start the next, we'll go to a new lesson. Uh, Acts 4, 29 to 31. When to 31 and then we'll read 33 after that okay are you there yes the sorry yes. sorry yeah. i was on mute yes and now lord behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness wait, of- Wait, 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 you, you didn't read 31. Oh, sorry. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now, you know, all of the apostles had been baptized in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. They were part of that 120 that the Holy Ghost came upon them, but that was not enough. As time went on, they were being threatened and they were being, you know, that they would be thrown into prison. They would this, that, the other. And even though they had been baptized in the Holy Spirit, it wasn't a once for all, a one time that takes care of for the rest of your life as this new occasion arose as these threatenings arose they cried out to the lord and they said lord you've got to help us because fear was trying to grip them they said that with all boldness we may speak your word we need your miracles we need signs and wonders all right to be done and as they prayed that way the Holy Spirit came again, all right, and fill them, refill them, can I say that? So we not only need one filling, we need fillings and refillings and being, being, we have another verse somewhere that says being, uh, be being filled. In other words, it's continuous going on of being fresh, in fillings of the Holy Spirit. And 33 says, after the Holy Spirit came on them anew and afresh, then they went and with power, they began to preach and no more fear of the threatenings. They were able to preach to the fact that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. Amen. So the last thing of strengthening for service is uh, that was about the enabling strength when we come against certain situations 
And now it says strength to be a martyr. All right. Witness is comes from that word called martyrus. All right. Let's look at Acts 1 8. Acts 1 verse 8. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Yeah. So you will receive this power is dunamis power, miracle working power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And we saw from that last verse it isn't just the first time when you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. It's any time you need to help and you cry out for the Holy Spirit. He comes on you anew and afresh and like uh, revives and quickens and makes himself real. All right. And when he comes upon you like that, the dunamis power is in there and you shall be witnesses. That word means martyrs to me. Um, when we think of a martyr, we think of, you know, dying out to Christ, having our head cut off, uh, being tortured, this, that, the other. But actually, um, that is not going to work out unless we learn to die out to self. All right. And this is the Holy Spirit's there to help us. People only see Christ in us. If they see you and the way you behave or the way I behave, the way I act and what I do, they're going to be turned off. But if they can only see the Lord, they're going to be drawn to him and want him. All right. And so the Holy Spirit gives us strength to say no to self so that the Christ in us can rise up and be seen in front of other people. Amen. Okay, uh, let's take our break here. And um, when we come back, we're going to start on a lesson called Speaking in Tongues. That's verse 12, all right? Um, come back at it's it's been on 1006 for quite a while so come back at 1017 all right 1017 praise the lord okay we're going to go to page 12 uh starting a new lesson speaking in tongues all right still about the work and the purpose of the holy spirit uh, number one, the anointing of the spirit. This is a little bit of a uh, review of what we had in the last lesson. In the Old Testament, the anointing came on three types of people. Prophets, priests, and kings. Ordinary people, unless they were one of these, uh, in the office of one of these three, they didn't get the uh, anointing of the Holy Spirit. And the reason was to equip them for their office. In other words, to give them the ability to function in their sphere of work, all right? To fulfill what God intended for them uh, in that ministry. They, they weren't born with it. They didn't, they weren't able to fulfill it on their own. They needed the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But in the New Testament, uh, this is B. And uh, number one, God's promise to the believer. Uh, in brackets after that, you, you can put there for us especially, all right, in Christ, all right. When we put believer in Christ, all right. Joel 2, uh, 28 and 29. Would you read that for us, Toyin? Yes. Joel 2, verse 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. 
and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. 29. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Yes. So when it says God's promise to the believer to pour out my spirit upon all flesh, all right, what, what he's saying is there's no distinctions, whether it's men, women, whether they're old, whether they're young, whether they're rich, whether they're poor, whether they're bond or whether they're free. So I, I'm going to give you a scripture at the side here. Will you Galatians 3, uh, 27 to 29. Galatians 3, 27 to 29. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Now, if you remember, Galatians is a Gentile, all right? Galatians is written to the, the Gentiles, all right? And so it's telling them, when you have been baptized into Christ, You've literally put on Christ. Now, uh, you've put on this new man, all right? And in this new man, in this being in Christ, uh, Jew or Greek, all right? There, there's no difference there, all right? No racial, no social, no sexual difference, all right? Male or female. That's what I told you earlier, all right? No male, no female. Uh, it doesn't matter. And uh, it's a handmaids well, and a handmaids and the men's service. That's the working class. All right. Uh, it, there's no rich, no poor. All right. Let, let's look at Colossians 3, 10 and 11. Colossians 3, verses 10 and 11. And have, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Yeah. So once we get in Christ, there, there's nothing dividing us, no levels, this, that, the other. Everybody's the same all right, in Christ. And in Christ, he says, I'm going to pour upon all flesh. That's what it means by all flesh. Those that are believers, all right, in Christ, those that are part of Christ. Actually, uh, we'll go ahead and read Acts 2, 16 and 18. It's just a repeating of Joel, but in the New Testament. Acts 16. 2, 16 to 18, yeah. 2, 16 to 18. But that is which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Yeah. So th this is showing us, all right, that God had given this promise. In the Old Testament, only three groups of people could receive it. But he said, the day is coming. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all my children. And of course, he was pro that was a prophecy concerning the coming of Jesus and through Jesus dying for us, he would open up the way for uh, all to receive. All right, Let, let's go to number two. God's anointing upon the believer is to function as a prophet, which is God's mouthpiece to be able to speak his words. All right, 
to function as a priest that's in ministry, worship, and intercession. Please, I'm talking about individuals who are baptized in the Holy Spirit, that we are in Christ, and Christ is a prophet, a priest, and a king. And therefore, when he wants to flow through us and function in any one of these areas, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, for worship intercession, this is a priestly uh, duty before the Lord, but the Holy Spirit enables us to be able to do what the Lord would have and then to be a king. That's what we just talked about in our last lesson, all right, a king in this life to rule over self, sin, and the devil, all right, uh, the life of Christ, he wants us to, he wants to shine through us, and so put there 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 12, and I, I believe that we already just read that, uh, yeah, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 was uh, this treasure in earthen vessels, all right, that the power might be. Uh, let's go ahead and read. We only read the one verse. This says 7 to 12. Let's see what that has to say. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. All right, so now, sorry, yeah, that, that's, okay, sorry, <laughs> read verse 12. 12, okay, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. Yeah, so going back to um, right there near the beginning, all right, it's showing, though outwardly we go through the same things as other people, all right, troubled, perplexed, persecuted, all right, cast down, but we don't have the adverse effect that it has on ordinary people because we have the Holy Spirit in us, this inner man that is strong and rises up so that no matter what happens outwardly, the, the inner man is stronger to come against it and not give in and not be, um, you, you know, overcome by it, all right? When it says in verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, in that he died, he died to himself. He died to his own desires. He died to his own wishes. Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to have pain. Uh, and in, in himself, he was truly a human being, but he had to say no I know this is what God wants, and I will allow it to happen. I will not, you know, try to fight against it. So dying of the Lord Jesus is dying to self. So it says all of us in our bodies, we have to learn to follow that, where we die out to ourself. And when we say no to self, then the life of Jesus, all right, what he is now, the resurrection life of Jesus can show itself through our bodies, all right, that we're not what we used to be. We're not just an ordinary person. Uh, when, as Christians, we go through these things and we respond in the same way anybody else does, we're not walking after the spirit, all right? We're not walking after the spirit at all. There is an inner man and the Holy Spirit is there to enable us to live, walk, talk, act, behave 
the respond the way Jesus did, all right? So it says in 11, we which live, that means those of us who have accepted Jesus and are made alive from, you know, we were dead in trespasses and sins, that spiritual death, but now we are alive in the realm of the spirit. We which live are always delivered unto death. God allows us to face situations where we're constantly having to say no to the self. All right. And it's for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus, if we face these bad situations and deny the self and in our heart, we're crying out to the Lord, then the Lord is able to live through us and show this other side. If we don't deny the self, he doesn't have a chance to live the life of Christ through us. All right. Because we've already taken over and just behaving like anybody else would behave. All right. So it says death is working in us, but life in you. In other words, so that we're, we want to live in a way that we're always dying to the self so others can see and be made alive in the Lord. All right. So let's go to number two. God gives a sign or an evidence. Uh, and I've got here, A, a sign for salvation, B, God's sign for the Savior, uh, C, God's sign for his anointing. That means the Holy Spirit's power poured out in the Old Testament. So let's look at these three first, shall we? God has a sign. He doesn't leave us to try to figure it out. Do I have this? Do I not have this? God's sign for salvation is the blood. It's the blood. Let's look at Exodus 12, verse 13 and verse 23. Exodus 12, verse 13 and 23. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Okay, let me talk about that first, all right? The blood shall be for you for a token on the houses. And you remember that story where they killed the Passover lamb and they took his blood and they put it on the outside, the two posts and then the lintel over the door and it says here when i see the blood if you do what i say by faith it's not for you to look at the blood you obey me you believe my word you cry out to jesus uh, and say i believe you died for me lord put me under your blood when God sees that blood is there, then the plague, well, the death angel went through that night. See, the death angel was going to pass through and he would kill the firstborn in every house. But when he came to a house and saw the blood, he passed over and they were inside that house eating on the roasted lamb. They didn't come out, is the blood there? Is the blood? Once they obeyed and applied the blood, then they stayed under the blood. The blood was for God. All right, let's go to 23 now. Verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to... All right, just a moment. I, I, I'm going to add one. Read 22 and 23. Okay. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians 
And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. Yes. So what we can see here then the, the sign for salvation was the blood. All right. And that when I see the blood, that's God. I, I won't allow, God won't allow the destroyer. That means the devil and his angels, all right? And God's promise for protection was to stay under the blood. Uh, God gave that sign and God vindicates and honors it when he sees it's there. It's for you and myself to stay there. He said, don't go out from under it. If you do, I cannot promise you protection. But as long as you stay under it, that's why number two says the blood provides protection and safety from the destroyer, from the plague, and from destruction. And I want to tell you, friends, the blood, as long as we're under it, all sin is covered. When we do something wrong, you have come out from under the blood because you cannot sin while you're under the blood. It means you've given in to yourself. You need to confess it, admit it, repent of it, and ask God to get the blood back on you for him to see you're under the blood. Not for you to say years ago, I got under the blood. Are you still under it today or not? That is the sign to stay under the blood. That's for salvation. Let's look at the sign for the Savior. All right. Um, Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. All right. Um, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. All right. Again, the sign comes from the Lord. All right. And that is the virgin birth. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and you shall call his name. What? Emmanuel. That means um, God with us. All right. God with us. But the sign is it's a virgin, all right? She, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, all right? The fulfillment of the prophecy, Matthew 1, 23. Matthew 1, verse 23. <clears throat> Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Which being interpreted is God with us. Yeah, let's go up there to chapter one, verse 18. Okay. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. All right. Now, what, what that means is, all right, she was a spouse. She was engaged. She had not married him per se. She had not fulfilled what it takes in marriage before they came together, before they came together. She was a virgin before uh, they came together. Yet, while she's still a virgin, she was found with child. But it was by the Holy Ghost. You remember that whole story. I'm not going to go into it, all right? <clears throat> but God gave the sign. And whether people understood it or not, if you go on and read here, her. in fact, let's read that. 19 right down through 22. Okay. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Yeah, because if they were found 
pregnant before they had married, he had every right to bring her out in the open and they would have stoned her to death. That was the punishment in those days. Everybody would have stoned her. But um, Joseph, he was just man and he didn't want to do that. Also, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, don't be afraid. Take her for your wife, but don't come together. Don't do anything and told him what had happened. So he didn't just do it because he loved her so much. I don't want her to get in trouble. God told him what to do and he listened. Verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Yes. And so I, I just reduced it into those two small things. God gave the sign. It doesn't matter if people believe it or not. God gave the sign. She was a virgin. All right. And the work was all the work of the Holy Spirit. Now let's go to the sign for his anointing in the Holy Spirit. That means for his pouring out of his spirit upon these three classes. They prophesied, all right? Prophets, priests, kings. And I've given you an example of each group. Let's look at the prophets first of all. Numbers 11, 14 to 17. Numbers 11, verses 14 to 17. I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight and let me not see my wretchedness. All right, so this is Moses talking, all right? He's complaining of his workload and he's just saying, I, I, I can't take it. He had the Holy Spirit on him, but he said, I just can't take it. And uh, in, in uh, and just like it says here, if, if you're going to keep wanting me to do this all by myself, then you can go ahead and kill me because I just can't bear it. All right. He's really complaining to the Lord. Let, let's look here in 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will, should I keep going? Yes, yes. And I will, and I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee and will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. All right. So what is God's uh, remedy? I will take of the spirit. Uh, this, whatever it says there, verse, cross that off and put 17 there. All right. I will take of the spirit which is upon you, and I will put it upon them. All right. 70 of them. So let's go in this chapter 11 down to verse 24 uh, through 29. Chapter 24, sorry, verse 24. Yes. yes. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders 
And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. But there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of one was Eldad, and the name of the other was Medad. And the spirit rested upon them, and they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. And there ran a young man and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad do prophesy in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, My Lord Moses, forbid them. And Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake? Would God that, that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them? All right. So we can see here, all right, the 70, all their names, not only that's to me amazing because they were told to come out. These two didn't listen. They stayed in the camp, but their name was on that list. And when God took of the spirit on Moses and put it on these 70, even those two whose name was on the list and they were still in the camp, they all did the same thing. They prophesied. They prophesied. This is the sign of in the Old Testament, when the Spirit of God came on them, they prophesied, all right? Uh, let's go to number three over on page two. We're not going to go to the priests first. We're going to go to the kings next, all right? Mainly because it comes first in the Bible. First Samuel chapter 10, verse 1 then three to six, then nine to 11. We'll do it in its order, all right? Um, first Samuel chapter 10, verse one. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, it is not, be it is not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance. Yeah. Is it not? because the Lord hath anointed thee. In other words, he was being anointed to be king. This is uh, talking about Saul, all right? Now let's go down to three to six. This is three to six. Then, thou sh then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shall meet thee three men going up to God, to Bethel, one carrying three kids, and another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute thee and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of that, their hands. After that, thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city that thou shall meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them and shalt be turned into another man. Yeah. Now, I'm just going to explain a bit here. Uh, they have three kids and three loaves of bread, and they're going to give him two of the bread. Uh, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Number three, number one is God the Father. Number two is Jesus. And number three is the Holy Spirit. And they give him two. So it's like they're filled with the Spirit in order to impart Jesus, all right? And that if it was imparted to him, Christ was, this is speaking ahead, of course, by faith and by type, by typology. And that's why here in verse six, it says, when you come to them, all right, the spirit of the Lord is gonna come upon you and you're going to prophesy. In other words, the sign 
he was anointed to be king. And when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he would start to prophesy. And it says, you will be turned into another man. That, that is, he was a new creation. And I really believe in picture and type. That was what the giving of the two loaves of bread was. He receives. In fact, when, when we receive it, I mean, when we read it, um, just a minute here. I, I don't find it. Anyways, it tells us that actually when the Holy, when um, Saul turned to leave, all right, uh, the Bible says that he was turned into another man. So he did not receive the Holy Spirit as an unregenerate person. The Lord saved him. And then when he met those prophets, the Holy Spirit came upon him. He was anointed with oil, but he needed that inner work done in him. All right. And he prophesied. So the sign in the Old Testament for prophets was to prophesy the sign of the Holy Spirit. When it was put on kings, they prophesied. David also was anointed to be king. All right, let's read Acts 2.30. Acts 2, verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Right. We won't read more of that. This is just to show us that he prophesied. All right. David also was anointed to be king, therefore being a king, uh, showing David also prophesied. That means when he was anointed and when that spirit came upon him, he prophesied. So besides being a king, it, he had been anointed and did prophesy. OK, the priests, let's look at this. This is before New Testament, though it's written in the New Testament. It is before Jesus died and arose from the dead, and it is before the outpouring of the Spirit. So it's still considered Old Testament times. Luke chapter 1, 41 to 45. Luke chapter 1, verses 41 to 45. And it came to pass, when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and bless, blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the, the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. All right, now Elizabeth was the wife of Zacharias, and he was a priest, all right? She had to be the daughter of a priest for him to be able to marry her, all right? And when she was filled with the Holy Ghost, she spake with a loud voice. This is all written on your page two. Uh, no, um, that would be page 13. All right. And began to prophesy. And, you know, you say, what do you mean? Look at that. When she saw Mary. Now, Mary never told her, I'm expecting uh, you know, I had this encounter with the Lord. Mary never said anything. Um, she goes there because Elizabeth is her cousin. All right. And um, it tells us Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And what she says with a loud voice, it wasn't even just her normal voice. The Holy Spirit moving on her, she began to speak out. All right. 
and said, blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Whoa, how come the Lord, the mother of my Lord should come to me? She didn't know Mary had a baby or is having a baby that she was pregnant. She didn't know any of this. That's what prophecy is. She was telling out what she herself knew nothing about, but through the Holy Spirit, she was prophesying it out. We're showing that priest, she was the wife of a priest. When the Holy Spirit came on her, uh, she prophesied. Zacharias, the priest, look at verse 67. Zacharias. Verse six, uh, sorry, chapter six, verse seven. No, Luke one, verse 67. Mm -hmm. The same chapter we've been in. Okay. <clears throat> Luke one, verse 67. And the father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying. Yeah, so... Um, Elizabeth and Zacharias were the mother and the father of John the Baptist, if you remember. When he was as a priest and doing his duty, uh, if you remember, to go in before the presence of the Lord and to put all the different things that he was, remember an angel came and prophesied to him, told him that his wife was going to bear a son. And unlike Mary, when the angel came and told her, she asked, but she had faith. She just said, how is this going to be? I'm not married, so how is it all going to happen? It wasn't out of unbelief. Whereas with him, he just said, you got to give me proof. We're old. We've been praying for a child, but now we're old. We don't expect to have one. And, and how do I know you're telling me the proof? All right, which was unbelief. And the angel rose to full stature, if you remember, and said, I am he that stands in the presence of the Lord. And because you did not believe, he just told it out. There was unbelief in him. He found it hard to believe. I'm old. My wife is old. How in the world can this happen? It was different than Mary. Mary said, tell me how it's going to happen. But it wasn't out of unbelief. It's just she wanted knowledge, all right? His was out of unbelief. And the angel said, the whole time your wife is expecting that nine months, you won't be able to speak because you didn't believe. And I'm going to liken this to speaking in tongues. Friend, as long as you have any form of doubt and unbelief of what the word says concerning speaking in tongues, you will be dumb. You will not be able to speak in tongues. When you believe what the word of God says and accept what the word of God says, your tongue will be loose. And, and of course, that is under the new. We won't get there today. So I've showed you that the kings and the priests and the prophets, all three before the New Testament, under the Old Testament time, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they all did the same thing. Prophets, priests, kings, they all prophesied. That was the sign. And all of this was before Pentecost. All right. We're not going to start on D. All right. D is God's sign for his promise in the New Testament, all right? And we're going to find out that his sign in the New is to speak in other tongues. That's exactly what Joel told us, all right? It will be poured out upon all flesh, but we're going to find out there's a sign when God starts giving to anybody and everybody, if they're born again, if they're saved, he gives his own sign, and that is they begin to speak in other tongues. Now, we're going to save that for when we come back. 
And I hate to tell you, but it's going to be a long time, almost a month. All right. The next time I see you on a Saturday will be the, write it down, the 22nd of October. I believe I have the right date, 22nd of October. Though we're closing down Zoom from the 1st to the 15th, um, there, a Saturday won't show up until the 22nd. So I will see this class, Lord willing, on the 22nd of October. Don't get lost in all that time. I will still be busy, but I will be teaching every day four to five hours. And though I end on a Friday, I, I was tempted to say, well, I'll do it on the Saturday. No. <clears throat> Unless I hear from God very clearly, I have to give my voice a little bit of rest. All right. So I will see you on the 20th. Bless. I pray you were um, blessed with what we did learn. And then when we start next time, we'll go into the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament and God's sign for that. Bye bye.